All right, I'll try to talk about um, My name is Pat Mochel. I am here to talk about the Linux kernel driver model and SysFS, which are both important features in the 2.6 kernel. Um, and I'm going to talk about how it's making the world better one subsystem at a time, and how it's such a great thing. Um, if anybody has any questions, we're starting a little late, um, about 10 after, and I know there's a talk starting at 5, which will probably be well attended, so I'm going to try and make it within that time. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to raise your hand. And if I'm talking too fast for anybody, um, feel free to uh, raise your hand and tell me that as well. So, moving on. Um, I'm going to try and move quickly to, to talk slowly. So, uh, I'm going to talk about kernel driver model and system effects. And I'm going to answer these basic questions, which are probably all burning in mind. What is driver model? What is system effects? Uh, why do I care? Uh, how do they work together? And can you prove it? And I'm going to explain each one of those, and of course, I can prove it and prove to you that you should care about them very much. So, first of all, what is the driver model? The driver model is a collection of data structures and programming interfaces inside the kernel. Uh, it's really quite simple. It just describes common device driver objects. Um, I know a lot of you probably are familiar with object oriented programming, and if any of you have done kernel work or followed the kernel at all, you know that there's um, a strong aversion to object-oriented programming because it's commonly viewed as evil because of languages like C++ and Java. Well, there's a use for object-oriented programming, and I think that Alan said it best, best one time that object orientation is in the programmer's mind, not in the language, or something to that effect. And so this, the Dark model follows that theory quite well. So we're trying to describe um, self-contained objects and things um, using C, of course, and inside the kernel. So, what the driver model does is it tries to distill down and tries to identify what some of those objects are that are common to a lot of different subsystems, and it captures them into instructions. Um, it also consists of a set of libraries for subsystems to use that manipulate those objects. Uh, it's not for low-level device drivers at all. It's only for the subsystems to use. Uh, so that has a couple of effects. One is that it's completely transparent to most of the device drivers that are in the kernel, as well as to most users. And it's also um, it also makes it very simple to implement um, on the subsystem level. So, that being said, that's it. That's all it is. Most of you can uh, think of it. Uh, since most of you will never see it, you'll never experience it, and you'll never have any problems with it, it will just work perfectly, of course. Uh, that's pretty much all there is to it. However, I traveled very far to come here to give you this talk, so I'm going to say a few more things. Uh, first of all, some of the concepts of the driver model are the data structures. And this is the very core of it. Um, there's four basic data structures, one extra one that's kind of core data structure, and then two more in the first row, which I'm not going to talk about. So the four basic ones are, the number one one is struct device. It represents a single device in the system. It has no hardware access whatsoever. It doesn't care about I.O. ports, it doesn't care about memory addresses, it doesn't care about location on the bus. All it has is really simple attributes like the name, a bus ID, um, a parent pointer, and a list of children. That's it. It's very simple. Um, there are fields that pretty much every device in your entire system has a function. Like no matter what bus it's on, whether it's a serial device or whether it's a PCI network card, it doesn't matter. It all has those common features. The next one is a struct bus type. This is not a bus, like an instance of a PCI bus. It only describes a, a type of bus. So there's one per subsystem. There's one for the PCI subsystem, there's one for the USB subsystem, there's one for the serial subsystem, et cetera, et cetera. And all that does is it says that, hey, this is a type of bus that's in the system. And it has basically two things, a list of devices and a list of drivers that are attached to that bus. And some lots of tech and some other things here and there. But for the most part, these are The next one is struct class. And it's really called struct class. And the person who wrote that did it just to piss off C++ programmers and the fact that uh, it confuses people. So uh, it's called struct class. It describes one functional class, and there's one per subsystem, uh, like networking and input. And like the bus type, uh, it only has a list of devices that are attached to it and associated with it. And then, of course, there's struct device driver, which uh, exists one for each driver in the system. And there's a device driver specific to a bus and a particular class, like you'll have the E1000 driver, is a networking driver that controls Intel PCI network cards and 
that and when it will come down support. So they basically only have a list of devices that the driver supports. And these lists, everything that um, are listed here, are contained in the core objects that are in the driver model itself. Now these device, these um, these objects and these structures are pretty much never used by the drivers themselves. They're only used by the subsystems and by the driver model support, which I'll explain in a second. So the interfaces that the driver model has are pretty much four basic things, register and unregister, uh, which is, are used when a device is discovered or an object is created. The subsystem will register the device with the core, which will insert it into the list. So if you go back, we have this list of devices and drivers that the bus has. So when a bus finds the device, it will register it with the driver core, which will then add it to the list of, of devices that the bus has. Now you think, well, why doesn't the bus just move this up? I'll explain that a little bit more in a second. But for the main reason is because uh, the locks and the lists are contained in these central drivers, these central driver core objects. And so all access to them is mediated through the very core itself, which reduces the complexity of the subsystems themselves and keeps all the common code in one place. So the other thing is uh, get and put reference counting. We use a lot of uh, reference counting in the driver core because it's scalable. It's much more scalable and much more efficient than using any type of types of blocks. And also guarantees that we can be safe against devices or drivers going away, like modules being loaded and unloaded, and devices being plugged and unplugged. And so by using reference counting, we can be sure that we're always accessing fresh data at the right time, and we don't stop all over that network. And we also have SysFS file creation, which is mediated through the driver core. And I'll talk about SysFS in a moment. Um, but uh, for the most part, just know that anytime you want to access SysFS through the subsystems, the subsystems are actually calling it through the driver core. And then, of course, there's driver binding and unbinding. And so, when a device is discovered by a bus, it's registered with the core. Uh, when a driver is loaded in a module, it's, registered, it's loaded through the subsystem, it's registered with the core. And then there's um, access functions to control and to uh, mediate the association of the driver with the devices. Because different buses handle in different ways. We'd like, we'd like every bus to have to handle it in the same way, but unfortunately that's not the case. So, um, talk a little bit more about the driver layer, the driver, model, the driver model, is that it's a simplification layer. It's not an abstraction layer. In the kernel world, we don't like abstraction layers. Because abstraction layers are bad. Just remember that. Um, we, are not, we have never tried to be everything to everybody. We want to try to take very the most common data elements in the structures that are shared or created among all the different subsystems and distill them down into common objects and essentially simplify the subsystems that you're using. Them. We never wanted to create something that encapsulated every single subsystem in the entire kernel. That just doesn't make sense. Plus it behave differently, fast it behave differently. We wanted to find a common set of functionality that most people could use. And so by doing so, uh, we've been able to create a very gradual evolutionary system by taking common components, adding them to the structures, and then gradually converting subsystems to use these, these data structures and, and embedding them in the larger structures that the subsystems use. And so what this does by, creating, by using statically allocated embedded data structures, um, we can convince the subsystems can adopt the driver model by simply inserting the data structure in the larger data structure and then all of a sudden it's converted to the driver model. It's just like that. It's very simple. To convert any need to the driver model, it took three lines of code. And it was magic. It just perfectly worked. And so it's, that also lends to the transparency of the entire model. No one knows that it's happening. No one needs to bother with it. It just works. The library functions that I mentioned before, the interfaces, are helpers. They're not replacements. They're not meant to replace PCI device register or PCI driver register. They're only meant to help the PCI subsystem in the job that it's doing by taking care of the list management and taking care of the locking and whatnot. Okay? Just, um, they're meant to take away the codes and then um, instead of an augment the functionality rather than replace it. And it takes care of redundant features like list management, locking, and counting. So the subsystems don't have to worry about doing it themselves. So, now that you're all convinced the driver model is a good thing, um, this is how it helps the kernel. It makes the subsystem simpler. Um, it reduces the code size, which is always a good thing. So one of the things that we learned um, after many times of trial and error is that uh, we try an interface, we try 
implement a feature in the Java model. And as soon as we found one that made, made it able to made it possible to re, uh, remove 100 lines of code, we knew that we found the right choice. Um, it creates a mechanism for more consolidation and simplification. Some of the hardest choices to make and some of the hardest code to write is the first step. The first step is always the hardest. So uh, we found that as soon as we started to implement features in the driver model, a lot of people came to us and said, wow, I've been wanting to do X for a long time, and now that there's an actual subsystem that will take care of it, now there's an actual uh, interface and infrastructure set up uh, to build off of, it makes it a lot easier. And we kind of let them live away. The last of driver subsystems to scale up and down. Uh, some of the subsystems weren't able to handle dynamic device uh, discovery or registration. Like serial devices had a statically allocated list of 1632 devices for years, because no one would ever need more than that in many serial devices, which is all well and good. I mean, most people don't have that many more serial devices, but when it comes to locking and when it comes to devices all of a sudden disappearing and reappearing, um, became a huge mess. And so, by using, um, by having all the list management and all the registration functions centralized, we were able to um, mitigate the pain that was involved in converting to a dynamic registration model, as well as being able to scale up. We have um, dynamic allocated objects, um, we have lists that grow instead of static allocated arrays, etc. etc. And it also enables features like power management and uploading. And now you're saying that Linux has always had top plugging and power management. Well, almost. But, uh, and they always worked relatively well, or relatively bad, depending on how you looked at it. Uh, what the driver model does is it allows uh, much easier uh, usage and much easier implementation of the power management than the top plugging. Uh, I'll talk about power management in a moment and top plugging maybe a little bit. But yeah. So, moving on. Uh, does that all make sense so far? No? Okay. Louder? Okay. Alright, so. Is that better? Alright. Does that mean you buy new beer afterwards? Alright. So. What is SysFS? How, how many have heard of SysFS? All right, I have a fan. Um, SysFS is an in-memory file system based on RAMFS. Um, it's in the kernel itself, and the kernel is created by the kernel when the kernel starts up. So it's very similar to the proc file system, but it's based on RAMFS. Proc was written before the VFS layer. When the VFS layer was written, RAMFS was written, and it just became the world's simplest file system. It is incredibly small and very simple. And so SysFS was based off of that. Uh, it also takes advantage of all the VFS uh, features and makes it very simple to use. So what it does is that it exports kernel objects, their attributes, and their relationship between, them, between the different objects to user space. And that's a pretty high level view, but I'll explain more in a moment. Uh, it also presents a really accurate view. If you're familiar with proc, you know that proc is totally anarchic. It's chaos. Everything, things are placed randomly. You can never find anything unless you happen to know where it is. And when new things are added to it, it's added wherever the driver author or wherever the subsystem author wants it to. So this is not like that. We impose restrictions that are implicit in the, in the entire system that give it an organized, hierarchical view of what's in the kernel. So, um, everything in SysFS is dynamically created and it's module safe. Other, thing, other things in proc does not have. Uh, some things in proc are dynamically created, but you're not supposed to do that. Uh, the locking is really bad. It's always been really bad, and it's really unsafe to remove things from proc once they've been created. Uh, that's not so in SysFS. We fix those problems. Uh, we also make it easier to expose user accessible controls. Uh, we try to impose restrictions of having one value per file in every SysFS file. Note that they're ASCII and can only think so they can be read on the command line using cat and echo to read and write the values, uh, with some exceptions, but those are special cases that don't need to be discussed now. Uh, make it really easy to expose these attributes, and so instead of having 
code that people copy over and over and over that is 50, 100 lines long to export one single value in the user space, uh, and thereby copying the same bug in 200 different places, like people did in Proc a couple of famous times. Uh, we make it easy, so easy that it's three lines of code to export an attribute to user space. And to read and write it is pretty simple. Now, of course, there's other setup you have to do, but then just watch, watch this movie here and then believe what I said. So, a uh, little history about SysFS. It was created uh, as DDFS, the device driver file system, uh, to expose the device stream when the driver model was being created. I worked at a company called Transmeta, and when I started working on, working on the driver model, and I created this device tree, and I needed to debug it. And so I walked into this guy's office that I worked with, and I said, hey, this is what I've done. Uh, and I, was thinking, I wanted to debug it, so I was thinking of using proc. And he said, proc is crap. Like, don't use proc. And he didn't actually say that. Um, he said it in a much harsher way, but, which is not family safe. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, he encouraged me to write a new file system and imported me at RamFS, which he had just written. And I said, wow, OK. Uh, I've never written a file system before, but it sounds easy enough. And uh, I went ahead and did it, and it was very simple. So uh, as the driver model grew, we added more objects to the driver model. Uh, the driver model started as just devices. Then we soon added buses and drivers and classes to represent all these different objects that we found. Uh, and I wanted to expose those through the file system. So I changed the name to something a little more user-friendly, DriverFS. And that's about the time we got integrated into the kernel. Uh, and I had an interface with two sets of FS to add all these new objects, buses, drivers, and classes. And in doing so, I had to extend the interface a bit uh, so that there are certain specific calls in two sets of FS to add these different objects. It didn't scale very well. And Soon, other subsystems wanted to start using SysFS and the driver model, like the block subsystem. Wanted to use it to move the system and to find a root device. And uh, they wanted to move the select device, which I thought was really bad. So what we did is we created Spark K object and changed the name to SysFS and made it even more generic, uh, much to the chagrin and much to the dislike of many people. And uh, sorry about that. So, uh, I'll just talk about cabinets for one moment because it can get very, very nasty and they can uh, give you a picture very quickly. So, cabinets are simple objects. They're distilled from common fields in the driver model. So, I mentioned before that uh, the driver model objects have very common uh, attributes and fields that are common to different objects throughout in the various subsystems, right? So, every device has a name, has a bus ID, has a parent, has a list of children, uh, no matter where it is. So. Buses have a name, and they have a list of children, and they have a parent, uh, and so do classes, and so do bus drivers. So we took those, and we put them in this really simple, small object called KI. And what that does is it creates a very small, generic object that can be reused throughout the kernel. And no matter what subsystem you're using, whether it's devices, whether it's drivers, whether it's uh, block devices, or file systems, anything. And what that does is it provides you a very uh, simple set of management functionality that these subsystems can use. And so what this does, most of this is not important for the sake of this discussion, but just to uh, explain, each of the best directories relates to one payout. Uh, everything is registered behind the scenes by the driver report. So it's completely transparent. The, subs the driver sub subsystems don't even see the payout objects at all. They don't touch them, only the driver report does. And each SFS directory is created when the KFX is registered, so it happens automatically, and it happens for free. So the PCS subsystem will walk the bus discovering devices. It will register devices with the driver core. The driver core will then register the K object with the KFX subsystem. Now, when you're doing that, you have all of the location information preserved. You know where the devices are, when you found them. You know who the parent is, and you know where, where, who their siblings are. So you register them. And you register that with the file system, and then all of a sudden you have this directory tree that you get for free. And you know exactly where everything is, and it's completely active. So, now that you, your eyes are all based over, work, uh, I'll give you one second. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Uh, so, uh, cabinet directory, cabinet is not just a best directory. 
files are attributes of the address or of devices or any other object in the subsystem. Um, those are regular text files that are um, represented in the file system itself. Siblings are relationships between A objects. So uh, it makes it very easy. Like you have a struct device and or you have a device and that's not to a particular driver. The device knows who the driver is, and the driver knows who clues what devices it controls. And so you use a sibling to rig in the file system to, vi uh, to visually expose that relationship uh, because it's already there in the kernel, and so you can uh, very easily represent it in the file system. So, why should you care? First of all, you might already be using it. How many people are using 2.6? All right. Uh, so, you're already using it. It's been in the kernel since 2.5.1. Uh, in December 2001, roughly around there. Uh, SysFS is integrated and mounted by all the contemporary distros. Uh, I know it's done by SUSE 92, because that's what this is. Uh, Fedora, um, Gen2, and I don't know about the other distros. Uh, not the distro, but I'm not really up on uh, where they're at. So, other utilities have started to use it. LSPCI now uses SysFS to get PCI information. Uh, CPU frequency scaling um, used it at some point, although I think that's being replaced by some other utility. Uh, block device tools are now implemented through SysFS, uh, like the request queue size and the scheduler to use. And power management needs advice hierarchy in order to properly shut down the system, suspend and resume all the devices in order when you're suspending to S3 or S4, suspend and resume or suspend this. So now, now that you're all completely uh, Confused and bored, I will uh, show you what it looks like because I know that you're all curious. So, uh, what do we have here? A large font? Is that really too small? Is that better? <laughs> Bigger? Oh, no, really. Is that okay? All right. So, as you can see, this is uh, Susan 9.2. Not to bless the Susan 9.2 distribution or to this any others, but um, it's just what I happen to be using. Uh, and at the F tab, we have, uh, you can see that this is mounted. Uh, it's actually mounted by the kernel on boot during the main manifest stage. Uh, and so it's not mounted automatically, it's already, it's already there. So, uh, what we have in, in the top level tree is all of the major subsystems that are represented in SysFS. Uh, we have the block layer, we have the buses, the classes, the device tree, uh, the firmware, um, a firmware interface, all the modules that are loaded to the module interface, which includes all the modules that are loaded in the system, and the power management interface. So, just to see, just to show you uh, an example of some other people that are using SysFS, uh, you can see if you look at the module directory, these are all the modules that are loaded on my system. So whenever module is loaded into uh, into the kernel, it creates a SysFS directory for each module. So if we look into the devices directory. Uh, we have the top level devices in the system. And the only one that we really have to care about for now is the PCI. Uh, PCI 000, which is the root PCI bus in my system. So, if we look at that, These are all the PCI devices, uh, at least the ones starting with four zeros of a colon. Uh, and you, you can roughly see the hierarchy of the tree. It's only a laptop, so it's not a very interesting PCI tree. Uh, there's about a dozen or so devices. Uh, you can see some of the devices, like the zero, 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 all, zeros all the way across to the top. That is the, uh, I guess this will work. That is the North Bridge, that's the uh, very core device. This next one is the PCI to HEP bridge. And the device directly under that is my TGP video card. 
And then over here we have, uh, even though you can't necessarily tell right now, uh, these are the USB devices that are in the system and some other audio devices and whatnot. So, And the bus directory, they have all the bus drivers that are loaded in my system. IDE, PCI, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, if you remember back to the very beginning, uh, when I was talking about the different uh, device model objects, uh, the bus type is one of them, and this is, these are all the start bus types that are registered for the system. Um, they have, uh, yeah. so if you look at, uh, this bus PCI devices, these are all the devices that the PCI bus has uh, found and discovered on its system. Now, all the devices are actually registered in the system in the device tree, which I showed you just a second ago. And so what is registered here is only the sim links that point to um, the locations in the device tree. Since there's no need to actually replicate the, the directory tree, um, since they're already created once, we just create a sim link in this directory that points back to its location in the, uh, in the uh, in the device hierarchy. So what this does is it gives you a flat listing because all the devices have a unique name or a unique identifier within the PCI tree and it points back to its unique location. And if you look in uh, the drivers directory, we have a list of all the drivers that are registered with the PCI subsystem. As you can see, there's a lot. With the standard distribution, they register all the IE devices just in case you happen to have those devices on your system. And they all get directories in the stream. So the only ones that we really care about for now are going to be the UHCI uh, USB control for the driver. So if we look in there, we see three siblings. Um, three devices have been registered with the uh, UHCI device because there's three USB controllers. And so each one of them gives a sibling back to the directory location, or back to the location in the device hierarchy that the, uh, that the device is located at. And so, if we look at a more complete view of the USB tree, uh, which is the USB bus type, and has uh, actually four controllers in the system, both UHCI and EHCI, we see all of the USB hub devices, and then a shadow device that is created for each hub device that is seen. Um, we have the hub driver and the USB driver, which are um, an internal, this is just an internal driver within the USB core. Um, that is registered in all the devices that are bound to each one of those, um, each one of those drivers. And of course, the siblings point back to the location in the device hierarchy that um, the devices are really at. Does this all, does this all make sense so far? Mm -hmm. All right, much better response than that stuff. So, uh, as you can see, there's also a few uh, drivers that are not being used by the USB subsystem, and so this is a really cool part. <laughs> This is a digital camera, uh, as you probably know. Thank you. So, okay, first of all, let's see. Everyone smile and wave. Hey, okay. So we take a picture, turn it off. So, we look at the USB uh, tree. Oh, sorry. This is what it looks like now. So, we take the device, a little flash reader with a uh, USB port, and uh, we plug it in. So, now, oh, now we look at the tree, and we see that some new devices have appeared. So, first of all, we have a USB device up here. Uh, was not in the uh, previous one. And that is the device that is discovered by the USB subsystem here. So that maps back to a uh, device in the device tree. Uh, it's discovered that it's a USB storage device, so now that there's, not that it's discovered that device, it also, see, it also knows that it's a storage device, so it registers with the USB storage driver. 
Uh, by doing so, it creates a symlink in the USB storage directory um, back to the location in the device, in the device hierarchy. So, if we look at that, the SCSI subsystem, since uh, USB storage devices are emulated with SCSI subsystem for some unknown reason, uh, we now have two devices that have appeared. And uh, actually, just to uh, show you that I'm not faking this. You can see that there are no devices here. I've unplugged the device, and so now I plug the device back in and uh, execute the same command again, and we see that there, uh, there are new devices there that have now gotten a new device ID because it increments it every time it finds the device and never decrements it for some reason. I don't know why. So um, now that we have new devices in the system, uh, we can now. Uh, all this happens automatically, and uh, all the devices and everything is discovered um, on the own. So, on its own. so um, let's
I think both Fedora and SUSE have been using it, and um, SUSE has been using it for some time. And so you can actually have a completely uh, dynamically created dev file system without having any device and entries. That exists all in user space, all the code exists. Yes?
So is it desirable to suspend a device even though there's no driver onto it? Uh, yes, because there are some devices that uh, have default state programmed into them. Uh, and other devices, like uh, for instance, purchase devices that will never have a driver onto them that have um, subordinate brain information, like what buses are being on them and whatnot, that need to be retained. And so, uh, there's been a number of solutions proposed there in the past years. Uh, none of them, some of them have been acceptable, none of them have been implemented. So, uh, such as implementing a default driver for bridges, or a default driver for uh, all devices of a particular class, uh, or in, being able to implement or attach multiple drivers to a single device so that you always have a default driver down to any device that will handle suspend and resume, while well, not necessarily supporting the functionality of the device. Like, uh, networking your video, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's something that just hasn't been, have, we haven't had a chance to do yet. Any other questions?